Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, I am having on Carolyn from the Homesteading Family. We're going to talk about learning old-fashioned skills, so where we first started learning them, tips for already having a busy schedule and feeling like you can't add on anything else, yet learning things like canning, food preservation, fermenting, all the skills that maybe you're wanting to learn, but maybe you feel like right now there's just no way. She really brings up some great tips about household management and trying to not add on certain things to an already chaotic home and laying the foundation for actually getting to be able to take on something new. So that was really helpful. She is a mother of 10 kids, so she definitely has a lot of wisdom to share in these things like running a household, learning skills while having children, if that's something that you find is difficult. She definitely has a lot of wisdom to offer there. So without further ado, let's join Carolyn for this conversation. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Well, it's great to get to actually meet you in person. I missed our last meeting regarding School of Traditional Skills, but uh, glad to get to be here today. Yeah, I know. It's so nice seeing you after seeing you on YouTube. Uh, that's my favorite thing about the podcast is I get to so many people. I feel like after we have a podcast together, I know them. So yeah, you get to get to have a little chat together. It's a nice introduction. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. So are you going to come to whenever your husband comes? I will not be, you know, it's a, it's this, uh, kind of fine balance of keeping the house and the homestead running and oh, yeah. having to travel, but Josh will be coming out and actually my 13 year old daughter will be joining him. He's, he's, uh, taking one kid on kind of each of the film shoots oh, okay. just to, he's going to be gone quite a bit this year with the different shoots. And so he'll be, you know, wanting to include them. So right. you'll have my, uh, 13 year old who is phenomenal at doing all sorts of things. And uh -huh. she'll be an extra set of hands for whatever you need from baby holding to, uh, to chopping veggies. She's pretty good. <laughs> okay. I have a 13 year old daughter and she's going to be so excited. Oh, oh yeah. Well, in that case, you may never see my 13 year old. They'll just be off having fun. Probably not because my <laughs> kids are super extroverted and whenever they meet somebody new, they're like off. So yeah, no, well, that's how ours are too. They're, they make friends very easily. And uh, from yeah. what I can tell, it looks like you guys have a very similar lifestyle to us. And so I think she's going to feel right at home. Oh, that's exciting. I'm yeah. excited to have them. I totally wish I could be there, but it was like, I actually don't even want to travel that much. <laughs> I kind of like blame my you. Home. <laughs> yeah. It's just too hard. Traveling is so hard. I mean, just getting time to even record a podcast is pretty much nearly impossible. So actually leaving... <laughs> Yeah, we, we traveled, um, let's see, we went out to Melissa K. Norris's because she was the first off-site shoot. And so I went with that one just to kind of make sure the film crew knew exactly all the pieces and to make sure Josh was getting all the things that I needed from my side. And um, and then as soon as we got back from that, we left and we went to the Redmond Real Salt Summit that was down in Utah. And I was like, that's it. I, that's all I can manage. I can't be gone anymore. Like, let me go home. And it, it just, you know, being gone, I think it was a total of about a week, but it just felt like so long. It was too much. Yeah. We're actually going on a vacation later this summer and I'm already like, oh, <laughs> it's just going to be so hard to coordinate it all. But, it really uh, is. Gotta do it. So tell us a bit about you, your your website, your YouTube channel, your family. I know you're a mom of many. I think your husband said nine. Uh, yeah, we have nine of our own and we're currently adopting a nephew right now. So okay. that kind of gives us uh, non-official twins because my son is nine years old and then our nephew is also nine years old. They're offset by okay. just a month or two. So there's okay. two of them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, doing anything with the business while also having seven kids is becoming more and more of a challenge because we homeschool. And so yeah. I'm like, Luke, I don't actually have 
any time. <laughs> Not just like I used to have the kids nap. That's how I built my whole business was on nap time. But now that they're, you know, school age, I'm like, I don't have actually any at all. Well, we did the exact same. I was emphatic that the kids would nap, so I would get a break. But the joke yeah. in my house is that as soon as mama has a few minutes of downtime, I'm starting a new project. So I started a business. And, yeah. um, you know, that <laughs> kind of consumed my break time at nap time and has kept me out of trouble for the most part for the last several years. Yeah. So tell us a bit about that. I know you're on YouTube and I know you have your website and a few courses and things like that. Yeah. Well, I think I'll even back up just a little bit and say, you know, this all started for me when I started trying to live a more resilient lifestyle myself and trying to implement it with my family and a quickly growing family. And I, I got really frustrated. Actually, I got, I don't want to say depressed, but it was really challenging because the information back at that point just wasn't there. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have podcasts the way that we have them now to learn. And so I just felt so much frustration over having to learn kind of by trial and error. And nobody around me had a large family much less a large family and trying to grow their own food and preserve it and learn about herbalism and all these different things. And so I just was, I found myself constantly frustrated. And so as I started, the, the fog started clearing and I started feeling like, okay, I get it now. Now I know what I'm doing. I understand how to organize it and, you know, make it successful. I just... I had such a heart to reach out to other moms who were doing the same thing. Who were like, look, I just want to feed my family really great food and work together with them and, you know, learn these old fashioned skills. But, but the information is hard to come by in a way that's actually practical. And so I started homesteading family because I wanted to be able to help other people, like cut through all of the misinformation out there, all the people who are just kind of regurgitating information that have never actually tried a project. Um, and so their their directions don't work well and help people really get to the heart of homesteading. So we've got our YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, all under Homesteading Family. We now have a blog, a very active blog at homesteadingfamily.com. Uh, we also have our own podcast called The Pantry Chat, and we teach classes. We actually have quite a few master classes on teaching old-fashioned skills from canning to homemade dairy, fermenting, uh, bread making, all those different things on our platform. And we now have a membership for people who really want to dive in deep and kind of do it all. Um, and it's it's just been so amazing to get to reach moms right where they're at, right at nap time, right? Right when they're trying to take their downtime and learn the things they're trying to learn to help their family be healthier and more secure. And uh, just to get to work with them and partner along with them to be able to help their families. It, it's just the most gratifying thing I think I could ever be doing. Definitely. I agree. So how long ago did you start your YouTube channel? <laughs> I think we started it at the beginning of 2017. Um, actually, we were at that point producing full length of videos for Facebook is what where we were publishing them back at mm -hmm. that point. That's what Facebook yeah. liked. And so as an afterthought, yep. I thought, well, I'm making all these videos. Let me just throw them up on YouTube and see what happens. And um and it, they kind of took off on YouTube. Now we don't put the full length videos on Facebook anymore. They just don't quite work for Facebook. But, you know, we're we're loving the YouTube side of things. Yeah. Now I'm doing the exact opposite. I'll make videos for YouTube and just upload them to Facebook. And they, they do okay on there. But like you said, it's not the best for that particular platform. Yeah. So what are some of your most popular skills, old fashioned skills that you're teaching? What are the people mostly coming to you for? You know, I think people right now, especially like right now, meaning 2022, people are concerned about food. And I mean, mm -hmm. rightly so. There's a lot of things to be concerned about. Um, you know, food security is one of them. But honestly, we should all be concerned about what's in the food that we can buy at the grocery store, because there's a lot of things in that food that is not 
it's just not healthful. It's not something we should be putting in our growing children's bodies. And we need to be more and more concerned about the ingredients and become a more informed consumer. So I think a lot of people are really coming to us wanting to learn preservation, food preservation, whether that's fermenting, canning, uh, freeze drying, dehydrating. We kind of do all of those things, uh, dairy making like hard cheeses, which is a form of food preservation. We're seeing a lot of interest in all of those things. Shortly behind that, though, is an interest in herbal medicine and kind of gaining a little bit of freedom from the uh, medical system and taking a little bit of control back from that. And, uh, you know, I just love teaching basic herbalism skills because those herbs just sit in your garden. You can grow them. And once you get them established, they just sit there for free waiting for you to need them. And it's it's such a uh, big opposition to the way the healthcare industry works right now, which is so challenging and so difficult to navigate and, you know, so exclusive in so many ways. And this is just such a open for everybody method that I I just love getting people more and more involved in that. And we're seeing a real resurgence of interest in that also. Yeah, I'm definitely finding that too. I've That's something that a few friends of mine and I have been talking about lately is it was all essential oils for a while. Now I feel like everybody's talking about herbalism, herbal medicine. For for whatever reason, that's making a huge resurgence. (laughs) I've noticed the same. Yeah. I, and I'm excited by it. I I love essential oils. I do use them in my home, but they just they lack the resiliency of the herbs in your front yard. It just you know there's no way. I actually have my own essential oil still, and um, you know so I have the ability to make my own essential oils, but. It takes so much plant material to turn it into a usable amount of essential oil that it's like it's just not viable for a home production system for most herbs. But herbalism is. You can absolutely take, you know, the leaves of a plant and turn it into a tea or a tincture um, on a scale that works for a family. So I think that's that's really exciting just to see that becoming so accessible to people. Yeah, I agree. So did you grow up learning a lot of these old fashioned skills? Are these something that you started to learn in your adult years? I grew up with a really good foundation in them. My mom was a phenomenal cook. She insisted on making us homemade meals, even when we desperately wanted the, you know, sugared cereals and things like that, that all of our friends were having. She would make us very fresh meals. She loved gardening she had a few chickens and she'd make a little bit of jam and can it, but it was really for her on a very hobby level. It was kind of just something she enjoyed doing and and really for the most part was not replacing items that would be purchased at the grocery store. But I think all of that gave me such a foundation in just seeing it done on a very, even, you know, relaxed light uh, version of what we would call homesteading. So, I think that was very foundational for me when it came to actually diving in and learning the deeper skills that would allow me to stop going to the grocery store. That was where I felt like I was kind of on my own. And I, I really had to dig for information. So You know, you can go to a ball blue book. You can pick up a ball blue book and you can get directions on how to can. You can get step one, step two, you know, you can figure it out. We all can kind of follow recipes like we're we're smart people, right? But the question really comes in, how do you make this actually fit into real life? Like, how do you do this day after day and week after week? And how do you do it when you've got toddlers running around at your feet? And, you know, when the garden needs something and the animals need something and the children need something, how do you actually turn these skills into a lifestyle? Mm -hmm. And that was where I really felt like, I had to learn the hard way, (laughs) like trial and error. I just tried this and tried that. And I actually dove back into any historical book I could find that talked about um, farm management or home management. There aren't a lot. And I think it's because that was something that was so passed down generation after generation. But it took digging into those things to find out, you know, how do we how do we make this work as a family? And that's where I really felt alone. And like I had to like figure out these skills all by myself. 
luckily now there's there's more people doing the same thing. So yeah. there's more of us who can sit and have the conversation and like, how do you handle this? And, and what do you do? And I just think it's so valuable to have that more available to people because it's it's a real question. Is it like, it's a really honest, real question. How do you turn all of these skills into an everyday lifestyle? Yeah, because once something does, once you don't have to think about the how, pretty much everything you try is actually easy. That's what I've discovered. Like right now, I'm really intimidated by making cheese and we have a dairy cow. So we obviously have so much milk. Every meal I'm like, hey kids, who wants milk? Who wants milk? Who wants milk? Have a pint of milk. (laughs) And I should just start making cheese because everything else I've tried, once it's in my routine, it's very easy. Like sourdough used to intimidate, fermenting foods. All of that was intimidating. And now it's so second nature. I know exactly what I'm looking for. Not a problem at all. It's not something that should even be on your to-do list of things to learn because it's as simple as adding, you know, this culture to this and it's, you know, this salt water to the vegetable. It's so easy. Like when we were talking about doing a fermenting vegetables thing, I'm like, well, this doesn't need a class, but maybe it needs my confidence instilled in you and not necessarily, you know, like I'll show you, but really you just need to know that this isn't that hard. So I think you're right. Like actually figure out how to apply this and get the confidence to do something is most of the battle anyways. Yeah, I think you are so completely right on that. And that, you know, I tell people often, it's it's the brain space of learning something that's hard. It's not the actual skill because most of these skills really boil down to you need to know what things to put together and what order to do them in. And every single person here is completely intelligent enough to do that and do it pretty easily and simply. But it's wrapping your brain around the process and getting to understand it. And then after that, it becomes kind of status quo. But it still becomes a like one more thing to put into the schedule. You know, I can't fit watching one more movie into my schedule and I don't have to learn anything to do that. So how in the world am I going to figure out how to start, you know, canning in the middle of all of it? And I think that's the hard part for a lot of people is figuring out the lifestyle skill. And and it, it's just such a good conversation to be able to have with people is how do you fit it in? Right, yeah. It seems like whenever you already have a packed schedule, like there is no way but I know from some of the things that I've fit in that there usually are ways. What are some of the things that you did? Because I know you do have quite a few young children. What are some of the things that you do to get to that point where you can like, okay, I I feel like right now I'm completely maxed out on time. I want to learn how to can. What are your tips for actually practically like fitting that in or starting on it? Yeah, I think we actually kind of touched on it a little bit. And the number one thing for me and for my household, especially if you have really small children, is insist on a nap time. (laughs) Make sure that everybody is napping at the same time of day or you have a quiet time in the house where the older kids are reading or doing something kind of autonomously to give yourself that place that you need when you're brand new learning a skill that requires you to focus. You know, you can't kind of pick and choose the safety steps to follow in canning. You have to actually focus the whole way through as you're learning. And then the next part of that is then get the kids involved. After you start feeling like you've got a grasp on it, bring them into the process. Do it with them. I now have older teenager kids and they can pressure can all by themselves. They've done it with me so often that they completely understand the process more than most adults that I know who can. Mm -hmm. And they can, you know, I can say, hey, we're kind of busy. Will you watch the pressure canner? I need to go do this other thing. And they're completely capable of doing it. So one of the keys here is get those kids involved, get them involved as young as possible so that they grow up with that skill because before long, they're going to be just doing it by themselves and it's going to actually free you up to do even more learning and even more things that you can then introduce into your household culture. Yeah. What are some things that you would say you do on like a daily basis? What are some skills that you didn't have maybe 10 years ago that now you have that you just second nature do like every single day? Yeah. In our household, we work a lot as a team. So there's a lot of kids who are doing some of the daily pieces to that. But um, for me, I know one of the things that it was really challenging for me, and that was being aware of my food stocks, being aware of the, the food that I had stored and where to use that. And so 
on a daily basis, I'm considering what food is in storage and what we need to use, what we need to use up now, what we need to maybe take those potatoes that are in the root cellar and they're starting to look a little shriveled and like we need to get them on the to-do list to do something else with them. That's kind of one of those unspoken skills of homesteading is keeping that mental list of the food stores. But, you know, when it comes to the actual skills, I find that now I can pick up anything and ferment it without a second thought on it. I can can most things without ever looking back at the directions aside from double checking the processing time. You know, there's just so many things that when it becomes something you're doing regularly, it, like you said, it just becomes intuitive and you don't really even need to think about it. Baking bread, um, making a lot of the homemade uh, dairy. Uh, we do that and we dove into the cheese really hard over the last about three or four years. Making hard aged cheeses seems so intimidating, but as soon as you get down the process, you're like, oh, let me check, double check the uh, ingredients amounts. And that's all you need to do because it just becomes mm -hmm. part of the mindset when you understand how it works it just clicks in your brain yeah. and you don't yep. need to think about it too hard. So I think all of those things are things that we really just do kind of on a daily basis around our house. Yeah. And like you mentioned, they kind of change seasonally. So right now it's getting toward the end of your food storage from last summer. And so there's, there's that aspect, whereas what you're going to be doing two months from now is going to be completely different than maybe what you're regularly implementing right now. It really is. Right now, the milk cow is dry. She's not due until May. So we're kind of in our, um, you know, drought right now, drought season as far as milk, which is also kind of a relief, yeah. you know, with a milk cow. It's like the amount of milk, it, it's this intense pressure every single day to make more room in the refrigerator mm -hmm. for the next day's milk. And uh, so we, we appreciate that break. But right now I am very intently cleaning out anything extra from the freezers and, you know, canning it, dehydrating it, freeze drying it, doing whatever I can, because I know as soon as that garden season hits for real, I'm going to be so busy. And then the thing that follows that is filling the freezers back up. Right, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, just everything is different. And that's one of the things I love about homesteading is I get bored easily. I get, you know, I don't do well with routine for too long. Right. And so I love it that it's so seasonal. It just changes every time I'm going, oh my goodness, I am so sick of making cheese. Then I don't have any more milk to make cheese with. And it changes. And I enjoy that process. Yeah. That same thing happens as your kids get older or you have more kids. Because I remember whenever I had two or three little kids, it felt like we had this very set routine that went on for, and we didn't have a homestead at that time either. And so there was just like this very predictable day for years. And I look back and I'm like, it is nothing like that now. Everything changes constantly. Like everything's just like a moving target. And I'm just trying to like, we need to have these <laughs> meetings with my husband, like all the time to see like, how, how are we supposed to navigate the next two months? You know, it's just those slow, very boring routine days. So what benefits have you seen and what are the reasons that you implement learning all these new skills when you could just as easily, you know, choose convenience? You can buy milk at the store. You don't have to make your own cheese. You can buy it. <laughs> what are some of the motivating factors behind a lot of this uh, skill learning? Oh, I think for all of us who are homesteaders, there's got to be some little bit of element of craziness, right? Because <laughs> yeah. you're right. You, well, you could just go to the grocery store. Like we do not need to work this hard. And I think that's why so many people look at us and kind of don't really get it. They don't really understand is because we live in such a culture of convenience. But what I have seen in living this lifestyle makes me realize how much our culture of convenience has actually harmed our, our culture and our families and our children. We don't have the benefit anymore of working together in the way that we used to. And the benefits that we've seen have become so apparent as our children have gotten older. Um, they know how to care for themselves. They know how to care for people around them. They know these really basic life skills and the amount of self-esteem and confidence that that gives a child is phenomenal. And I'm not talking about the self-esteem that comes from somebody telling you or some school program saying, you know, oh, you're doing really well. You're a good person. Let's feel good about ourselves. I'm talking about the kind of self-esteem that even my two-year-old, now she's four, she's not even two anymore. <laughs> they grow so quickly. Even my four-year-old knows that she's an important part of the team and that we couldn't do it without her. And that feels good. 
that creates something in children that you just don't see in this modern world, that they are actually a needed part of a team. The same thing with their health. Our children are have such incredible, robust health, but they've been eating right out of the garden since they were born. They've been eating straight off, you know, drinking milk right out of the cow from their earliest days. And I think the health that that brings is something that we just can't ignore. Josh and I both have very long living grandparents. And we were laughing at one point about how horrible they all eat. They, you know, they have a tendency to go to fast food just like every other day. And when we look back at their history, though, every single one of them was raised on a farm. Every single one of them ate solid homegrown food throughout their entire childhood. And I think that just creates this this health and this uh, foundational health that allows you to go a long ways into life. Even if you're not taking care of yourself very well later, you can get a really long ways because of that foundation that you get in health. So for us, I think it's the character qualities that come out from um, children learning to work together children being part of the team, the health qualities and the health benefits that come from eating just this phenomenally great fresh food that's just so nutrient dense. But also there's this lifestyle side that just says we're, we are in touch. We're in touch with each other. We're in touch relationship wise with each other because we're working together all the time. We're struggling through those hot days in summer where you just have to be out there picking all those green beans, whether you like it or not. And then we're enjoying it together on the other side. And then all winter long, we're sitting around the table eating these home cooked meals where we're saying, we grew everything on this plate. Do you remember that day where we were out there and we were picking it? And, oh, yeah, that's the day Johnny found the caterpillar on the green bean and he ate it. You know, like mm-hmm. these memories that come out, they just gel everybody together. And so I guess it's that lifestyle. It's not an easy lifestyle, but it is very simple and it is very good. And I think that just is something that connects us so strongly to the land and to each other. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's what we were meant to do. Just providing for our basic needs, like our food is so important because having a hand in that, I think we were just always meant to do that. So even though we don't have to, there's still a good reason to do it. And you don't have to have a huge farm to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, it does take a willingness to want to start stepping into learning new skills that will seem intimidating at first. And also sometimes you might talk yourself out of them because, you know, you don't have to do it. But there is something to be said, too, for quality, because, yes, you can buy milk at the store, but you can't buy the same milk. You also can't buy the same kefir. Mm -hmm. You definitely can't buy the same fermented vegetables unless you want to spend I don't even know. They have them now. I noticed a lot of grocery stores have them, but they're like $12 for a little jar. Yeah, it it is phenomenal. When you actually price out what it is that you can produce on your own uh, homestead, even, even with a very, very small garden, just a little bit going on, it is amazing what you would pay at the grocery store for current prices. And we kind of look at that and go, wow, this this is actually a really good economic deal. It's even pre-tax. You know, all of yeah. our food is pre-tax. <laughs> we don't even have to make the money and have it taxed before we spend it. <laughs> well, it's also, I think a lot of these foods right now are very trending. So fermented vegetables, sourdough, uh, herbalism, like you said, kombucha, kefir, this is all trending things. And so now they are available at the store, but they also know that people will pay for them because people are like, well, I want kefir, but there's no way I could figure out how to make it. And so, you know, they kind of capitalize on that. And so there is an economic benefit to learning yeah. that. So are there any old fashioned skills that you don't like or anything that you just would rather take the convenience route on? I know I have some for sure. <sighs> Let's see that I just plain old don't like. I don't know that I have a whole lot of those, but I do draw the line in a few places. And there's a few places that I have my boundaries where I actually just go ahead and purchase from store-bought. And that is that if I have to go out and buy vegetables or produce from the grocery store in order to preserve something, I refuse to do that. I will just buy the preserved version. I'm not going to go to the grocery store and buy tomatoes to can them. 
If I have to do that, I'm going to go to the grocery store and buy canned tomatoes. There's no reason for me to pay for it and work for it. I just won't do that at all. (laughs) So I tend to start back at the growing part myself or, you know, sometimes in the community, you've got great farmer's markets or things like that. If I can get a really good deal and something that's really fresh, then yes, but uh, (laughs) otherwise there's no reason to pay just to get yourself into a whole lot of labor. But I'm trying to think if there's something that I just really don't like doing. You know, things like butchering days are always hard and they're not high on my list of favorites, but they're always really rewarding at the end. So I don't think I would get rid of them even if I could for the most part. Those are the things that really stand out. Anything that requires a whole lot of cleanup or scrubbing pots is not high on my list. And I would be really happy if anybody who likes scrubbing pots mm. wanted to come live at my house and do all my pots. But <laughs> yeah, I think that hasn't been an option yet. Yeah, maybe if you had a maid hanging around or something, I don't know. So we could pay yeah, a full time cleaning nice. your kitchen. That would work. I think mine is, this made me think of it whenever you were talking about that, is making pasta. Like I love einkorn pasta. Ooh. And uh, mm-hmm. I also just buy it. I buy like 10 boxes at a time from Jovial because <laughs> it's... Oh man, it's such a mess. I'm like, okay, we just spent an hour in the kitchen and I now have one pasta dinner. So (laughs) there are definitely faster ways to get nutrition that's healthy than, you know, making certain things. Certain things are for certain seasons of life, I feel like. I I think that's probably a really good way to say it. And yes, pasta, especially when you have a large family, it takes a huge amount Mm -hmm. of pasta. You have no idea when you're just buying a box and dumping it into water, boiling water, how much time and labor actually goes into that same equivalent if you're hand making it. So yeah, that's always a challenging one. Well, and people tell me it is easy. So I'm like, it is, it's simple. I get it. It's just eggs and flour and salt. I understand, but it also just is that much more time before dinner's on the table. So that'd probably be one of mine. I'm trying to think if there's a few others. I will say that I'm, and this is probably just an excuse because you have more kids than me, but I feel like I'm in the season of life where I would rather stock up at the farmer's market than grow a lot of things. Mm. But maybe I just need to figure out how to fit it into my schedule better because right now I always really plant this very ambitious garden. And then when it's July, I'm like, I'll just go to the farmer's market. (laughs) Yeah, I can understand that. I think for me, anything that requires standing over the stove flipping for a long period of time, we don't tend to eat pancakes because it takes at least an hour of flipping Mm. pancakes before my whole family can eat. Tortillas, Oh, my kids love homemade tortillas, and I absolutely agree that they are better. Yeah. They are a hundred percent better, and I just don't think I have time in my life to make tortillas by hand. So, not at least not very often. Occasionally, right? Yeah, <laughs> I do it occasionally. Like if I have some meat that we really, the only way that we're really going to enjoy it is tacos. Like we order a hog, and so I end up not. I get so many pork steaks and pork chops and loin roast. And so I'll make those into tacos. And I actually found a source now for organic corn tortillas because I love over flour tortillas. I love corn tortillas and I've been, I make corn flour tortillas, but like you said, it just takes forever. And yeah. so I'm willing to pay a little bit to get the good source of yep. not homemade because <laughs> we do a lot of tacos and we can easily go through like 24 shells yeah, we, we like a lot of tacos too. Yeah. We're we're up in the 30s most of the time. Yeah, well, yeah, because we have we all need. little kids. I mean, our oldest child is 13, and then yeah. all the boys are still under the age of <laughs> nine and under. So yeah, we now have a 17 year old son who's working full time in construction, and okay, you know, he pretty much equals about three grown men in the amount of food he can eat at one time. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, that would change things. We have five little boys, but they're all little, so we're not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is great. But yeah, I'm sure I'll really not want to do tortillas then. So do you have any tips for someone who's overwhelmed with learning old fashioned skills? Where would you recommend them starting? You know, really, especially if you're feeling overwhelmed, the place to start, and this is an old fashioned skill, but it's also a modern skill, but it's it's really learning how to manage your household. That for me is really where you have to start because you, you can never take a situation where you're already overwhelmed and then just start adding more things and making it less stressful. So right. you really need to get what you have in order and in control first and get that running really smoothly. 
I actually have a series of YouTube videos on household management, how to oh. manage your household. I even have a, a in-depth class on how to do it on our website. But um, whatever you do, whatever your method is, get that running smoothly first and then make yourself room. The best way to make yourself room for learning more skills is to get ahead a little bit by getting some freezer meals done. Get something so that you can opt out of a dinner time once a week for a month or two, make some meals ahead, get them in the freezer and take really easy days so that instead of actually just going and putting your feet up, you're going and learning that new skill and making yourself time to do it because you have to clear the time on your schedule. You can't just squeeze one more thing in. That That's not healthy for any of us just to keep squeezing stuff in. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. At some point, something has to give. That's for sure. I've learned that with everything, <laughs> but I really am interested in your household management. Does this have a lot of like involving the kids and maybe some tips like prepping stuff the night before and cleaning all those tasks? Yeah. You know, it's, it really comes from the idea that your household has to run differently than mine. Um, everybody's household has to run differently. So I can give you all of my number one tips as to how I run my household, but it's going to work in maybe, you know, a third of other people's homes, maybe. We just, we all have different resources. We are all at different places in life. So I structure a lot more on how to structure your days and how to organize your time and your tasks in order to be able to make them more efficient so that you can do more because we want to do more. We all want to do more, whether it's more, you know, going on vacation or it's more, you know, traditional skills or whatever it is we're looking to do. In order to do that, we have to just get more efficient at what we've got to do in the background. We have to feed people. We have to keep the house clean. We have to keep the laundry going, no matter right. what else is going on in life. And so we talk about finding our base operating procedure, like what has to get done in your house every single day in order for it to stay operating. And if you only did those things in your house, could you just keep going through day after day that way for how long? Um, and, and really quantifying those and getting those in the schedule and organize, making sure somebody knows that that's what they have to do in your household so that your house starts running like clockwork. And as soon as that happens, all sorts of magical other things happen because you can choose how you want to use that time that is now opened up to you. You're not nagging everybody. Did you do this? Did you do that? Instead, you just get up and y'all get it done. And then you can move on to what you want to do in life. And that, that becomes really powerful. But, you know, I think so many times we look to Pinterest or we look online or ask our friends, how do you handle this one little thing? Well, Every single person here is smart enough to figure out their one little challenging thing. It's finding the bones and the structure to put life into that gives you the space to figure those things out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think there's a lot of value just in that because like you said, adding any of these onto an already stressed out, chaotic it's just not going to work. And so, yeah, getting that in order first makes a lot of sense. Yeah, You have so many resources. So can you share, are there any books, accounts, resources, like anything that re inspires you to learn more? You know, I think for me, I love digging into the historical information. So wherever I can find old, usually out of print books, I am grabbing for them left and right, especially the nonfiction, the, the how to learn something, anything that's related to things that I'm doing on the homestead. And that to me is the most inspirational because I feel like oh, I just don't want this information to get lost. There's so much value here. Let's make sure we turn this into a modern skill and then uh, you know, share it with other people so that it doesn't get lost in in the historical record because there's so many things that are. There's so many things that our great grandmothers knew that we've already lost. We already don't know how to do it and we've lost that information and we're having to struggle to find it again ourselves. Instead, let's make sure we're passing it on. We're relearning it where we can. We're preserving that information. We're passing it on to our children. Yeah, that's a good tip to look out for those old books, probably on like Thrift shops, but then also thriftbooks.com, places like that. You can find those kind of resources. Absolutely. One resource that I love is um, the, what is it? It's James Townsend 
Townsend.us mm -hmm. maybe is the, the website, but they do a historical reenactment gear and they've actually republished quite a few of these older books. And so you can go and you can find them in there. So that's oh, kind of a fun okay. way to find them too. If you're just not sure where to look in your thrift stores, you know, some thrift stores don't have those kind of really fun yeah. older yeah, things. Yeah, that would be hard to happen. Um, they've taken some of the books from the 1700s and 1800s and republished them. Oh, that's a cool idea. Yeah, I'll get you that link for sure so that yeah. <laughs> I can make sure it's dialed in. Yeah. Okay. Well, let us know any other sources that you have on your website, on your YouTube channel, where best for everybody to access all that information. We'll also be leaving everything you talk about down in the show notes below. Great. Yeah. So we have the YouTube channel. I share so much information there. We do about two videos every week between how-to videos. And then we have a kind of talk show style video we do weekly called the Pantry Chat, where we really can dive okay. into the theory behind homesteading and not just the exact how-to. And so we share a lot there. If you're interested in going even deeper and looking at some classes, uh, going to homesteadingfamily.com and you can see the class listing there. Uh, for you guys, I would love to offer you guys a 25% discount off the canning class that we have. It's a master class and we'll take you all the way from basic canning skills all the way to pressure canning and even canning meals. So I will make sure you guys have that link all available so that you can get a good discount there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure a lot of people will look forward to that, especially with the upcoming gardening season. Arming yourself with that knowledge is going to be really, really helpful. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me and for sharing all of your knowledge and skills. And I hope we've motivated people to just start and start trying things. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I hope that you learned a lot. Make sure to check out the link down in the show notes for 25% off her canning course. From everything I've watched by Carolyn and her family, they really know what they're doing when it comes to preserving and to gardening and homesteading. I've learned so much from them and from their pantry chats that I'm sure this is going to be a really wonderful resource. If that is something that you're wanting to learn this season, make sure to check that out. As always, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast.